Hi, everybody. Thanks for your patience. I'm Kristen Sonatera. I teach at the School of Information at the University of Michigan, and I could not be more delighted about today's, um, today's presenters. We have a really stellar team of folks here to talk about a really important issue in education, and that is um, the power and potential of open resources for your classroom. We have four presenters. They'll be introducing themselves. Um, as they go, and Kieran is right now pushing out a file of resources for you. So you'll see on your screen something that says Save File. And if you want to save it, just click Yes, and um, Illuminate will direct you to where it is that you want to save it to. Um, you may get a notice that I got that says it's not completely downloaded, so you'll, you'll find out when it's all set. So Karen will be um, taking the lead here in doing the introductions. She's with the Peer-to-Peer -Peer University School of Ed, or um, known as P2PU. Um, Jane Park is with Creative Commons and the P2PU School of Open, which we're really excited about on our campus at the University of Michigan. Verena Roberts is from the Alberta Distance Learning Center, and Jason Niefer is from the Montana Digital Academy. Um, we do have a hashtag for this virtual conference. It's um, hashtag 4T with a capital T, um, 2013. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, one is that if you're applying for CEUs, you should have logged in with your full name. And remember that um, Michigan legislation requires that even if the session um, ends early, uh, you have to stay until the end of the hour. So we're sorry about that, not our decision. Remember that if you complete the evaluations, and we'll put the link up at the end, you can be entered in the door prize drawings. And the moderator, um, you can uh, private message me, I'm Kristen, at, um, if you have any technical questions. Um, we have, I, we've skipped a couple of our regular slides in trying, to, um, in trying to get these slides to behave a little bit better than they are. Um, so if you are new to Illuminate, just know that, that you um, have the opportunity to chat in the box underneath the middle pane. You can chat by just um, typing in and using the default settings. Click Send. If you need to reach me, um, change the toggle down at the bottom so it says Send to Kristen and we can help you out there. Um, anything else, we'll brief you about along the way. So we'll look forward. I'll chat with you guys again in about an hour. See you then. Is this better? Can everyone hear me? My mistake. Great. I was just saying there's nothing more invigorating than a little last minute technology challenges. And I think in the course of trying to shuffle slides, I forgot to turn my microphone on. It's a pleasure to be here. And I appreciate everybody's patience um, as we're uh, shuffling slides around. And if we're missing a few slides, I'll apologize in advance. In the file transfer window, as Kristen said, there's a um, PDF of the slides. There's also a PDF of a handout with some different open educational resources. And then I'll post the link. There's also um, a blog post where you can download the full PowerPoint. And we welcome everyone to reuse these resources to do um, professional development or share with others at your own site. And the resources are all open licensed. So I'm really happy to be here with um, a fun panel of some of my good friends. And Kristen sort of briefly introduced people. And I'll give um, an opportunity for everyone to sort of introduce themselves as they um, do their sections. Um, Again, if you, didn't, if you just joined us and you didn't give it an opportunity, we'd love to see in the chat what open means to you, um, how familiar you are with open resources, and if there's something particular that you would like to learn tonight as a part of this webinar, um, please type that into chat and we'll make sure and see if we can get to that. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jane Park from Creative Commons and the Peer-to-Peer -Peer University School of Open to talk about what open means. Jane? Hi, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. Thanks, Karen, for the introduction. Um, so judging from your the variety of answers in the chat, um, you probably all got the point that open means various different things to different people. So this is kind of, this slide is a list of the open communities that exist around the world um, in different domains and fields. And it's not an exhaustive list. In fact, it, it, the slide itself cut off the list that, as I wrote them in. 
Um, so all of you have probably heard about open source software, open access to research articles, open culture that pertains to music and video, um, open data, open scientific research, open licensing, and of course open educational resources. Uh, we're not going to try to do a comprehensive definition of open today, but I did want to kind of give you a flavor of all the different open movements that are, that are advocating for open in their various fields. And the, the essential takeaway is that open means different things to different communities, um, but we are concentrating today on open educational resources and what open means as, pertain, as pertains to education and probably the medium that you guys are working with the most often. The definition of open educational resources is that Creative Commons supports um, and that as I believe a majority of the open education community supports is the Hewlett Foundation's definition. Um, and it doesn't have to be this exact definition, but there are two elements to this definition that most OER definitions um, should include. So if we read this definition, it reads, OER are teaching, learning, and research materials that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. So the two elements is free use and repurposing. So free use means you have the ability to access that resource for free um, without having to pay any money and that it's online and available free for you to access. But the second element that really makes um, an open educational resource an open educational resource is the fact that you cannot, that you can also, you can access it, but you can also repurpose it. So you have the ability to customize it, to revise it, um, to translate it, and to adapt it for your own context and classroom needs, um, and that you have the legal rights to do so. So those are the two kind of very important um, aspects of open that we're focusing on today, when, and that's what we mean when we say open. Um, so the definition itself is kind of convoluted, but if you, this is an easy way to remember. Um, as long as an educational resource um, enables you to do the four R's, it is an open educational resource. And the four R's are reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. So reuse, the fact that you can take a handout online and use it in your classroom. The fact that you can revise that handout um, so that it is contextually relevant to whatever you're doing in your classroom. And the fact that you can remix that resource with other resources um, to teach whatever it is you're teaching. And the fact that you can redistribute those materials, um, not just in your classroom, but on the web to other teachers. And that you have the legal rights to do all of these. Uh, so, uh, except that you can't do all of these things because of something called copyright law. And uh, so I'm sure you've all seen this symbol along with the phrase, all rights reserved. Copyright, um, at least in the United States, but also in many areas around the world, is a form of protection granted to the creators of original works of authorship. And it essentially governs what you can and can't do with copies of, of creative, educational, and scientific works. And all copyright owners are granted an exclusive set of rights to their works, and these rights govern what you can do with the copies. And in addition to the four R's mentioned, which they're kind of enveloped into these, um, these uh, rights. So they include the rights to distribute a copy, to perform or display a copy publicly, to adapt a copy in some way, such as translate, edit, or remix it. Um, basically, whenever you want to do something with a copy of a creative work, you are required under copyright law to obtain the explicit permission of the creator or the copyright owner. And copyright covers all forms of creativity, literature, music, architecture, and choreography, um, scientific um, literature, educational resources like textbooks. Basically, any creativity that you can set into a tangible medium is covered by copyright. And I'm sure you're all aware of exceptions and limitations to copyright, which is known as fair use in the United States. Um, and th there are certain exceptions and limitations, such as commentary, satire, um, um, certain transformative uses that are allowed um, that teachers rely upon. But fair use itself um, is not very explicit, um, and it's kind of it's reliant on interpretation of the law. And I am no expert in fair use, and I don't have um, the time to cover that today, but you can uh, look that up afterwards. So, whoops, I went all the way to the end. So let me try to navigate back. So in a digital world, which is today, teachers and students alike 
are not just consumers of content anymore. They are creators of copyright content, um, and they're creating uh, things every single day. And we have a choice about how we can share our creative works because we are creators. Um, and essentially, Creative Commons provides creators um, the option of granting copy and reuse permissions in advance that they didn't have before. So with all rights reserved copyright, the default is that you have exclusive rights, and in order for someone to reuse your work, they would have to contact you, and you would have to negotiate um, a certain contract or how they would reuse your work. But with Creative Commons, you can provide those permissions in advance so that you don't have to negotiate those terms each and every time. And so this is Creative Commons. We are a nonprofit organization. We're at creativecommons.org if you want to learn more about us afterwards. Essentially, how we pr provide you guys this option is by offering a legal framework for the voluntary sharing of creative and educational works on the web, such as music, videos, photos, and educational resources. And we do that through a set of copyright licenses that creators can choose to attach to their works with varying levels of permissions. As you can see here, there are six Creative Commons licenses that reflect the spectrum of rights a creator wants to communicate. And at the very top, there is a public domain um, indicator, and that's an additional tool we have to our six copyright licenses. The Creative Commons organization, we develop these copyright licenses, which are simple, standardized ways to grant copyright permissions to your work. And each of these licenses has different conditions depending on your needs, and which license you choose will depend on how you want to share your work. So all CC licenses uh, require attribution or credit to the original author of the work. So that is one condition that's automatically included in all the licenses. And then in addition to that condition, you can choose to add more conditions on how you share your work. Or you can choose to only have attribution as a condition. So if you go head on over to creativecommons.org slash choose, you can do this now or after the webinar. Um, we have a chooser tool that lets you kind of play around with choosing the different options to see um, what kind of license you might choose for your own work. So for example, you might want to apply, you might, if you want to prohibit commercial uses of your work, then you would apply the non-commercial condition. If you want to require that any derivatives made from your work also be shared back openly under the same exact license, you would add the share alike condition. If you don't want people to um, make derivatives of your work, you don't want them to translate or modify the material in any way, then you would add the no derivative works condition. Um, and so you mix and match these various conditions, and that determines which of the six licenses uh, you attach to your work. So all Creative Commons licenses have three layers to them. They are Creative Commons licenses are unique because they are the they are the global standard for copyright content licensing for a reason, and it's because they are expressed in three ways. At the base, each license is a traditional legal tool, which means that it has the the legal language that makes it enforceable in a court of law, and it has been vetted by copyright lawyers from all over the world um, in over 73 jurisdictions. It's been aligned to international copyright laws and all that kind of boring stuff that you know the average person doesn't really care about, but that you know makes it legally viable. And on top of that, the second layer is a human readable summary of the actual license. And it's for people like you and me, um, for educators, for artists, for scientists, everyone who is not a lawyer and who wants to be able to understand a Creative Commons license at a glance. And that's a human readable summary. And then on top of that is a final layer. And that's probably the most important layer um, and what really makes CC licenses viable for the Internet age. Um, this small um, snippet of HTML is what makes it machine readable. Essentially, at the license chooser tool that I mentioned earlier, if you um, play around with license options, you'll get a snippet of HTML code, which you can copy and paste into your website, and it automatically displays the license that you chose for you. And that is what makes your web page or resource um, discoverable um, on the internet through search engines like Google and Yahoo, because it automatically displays kind of what the fields that you've input, such as the author or the license and stuff like that. So you can go ahead and play around at creativecommons.org slash choose. Um, so Creative Commons licenses with the, the three expressions that they have, they've pretty much formed a legal and technical framework 
um, behind open educational resources on the web. Without Creative Commons licenses, open educational resources uh, would be under all different kinds of terms and conditions, and it would kind of be a it would probably be a huge nightmare trying to mix and match all the different open educational resources together when you're combining resources or to try to figure out what you can or can't do with a resource. Because of CC licenses, it's a lot simpler for educators um, to know what they can and can't do with a resource and which resources they can combine for use in their classroom. And you can search, and I know that people are going to go over this later, but um, Creative Commons also has a search kind of interface, a search tool where you can um, find open educational resources online, but not just open educational resources, but you know, open music clips, videos, what have you. Go to search.creativecommons.org. It's not a search engine, but it is a search portal into other search services on the web. And it's not the best thing. Um, but um, there, but it's kind of you know an opening into the search world. I think there was a question: whether teachers could mandate students to do CC licensing. Um, yeah, Karen is right. I I don't think I don't think teachers can mandate um, students to do CC licensing. Whoever is a creator of the work um, has to choose for themselves what license they would attach to their work or what terms. Um, so that was a very quick overview. I'm sure you're probably more confused. <laughs> and if, if you are, then I would encourage you to head on over to schoolofopen.org where we have a half hour a challenge that you can complete in half an hour that helps you navigate the Creative Commons website in four easy steps. It's called Get Creative Commons Savvy, and a lot of our participants have, great, have had great success with understanding Creative Commons by going through this challenge. Um, we, we also offer another course as part of School of Open, and that's called Creative Commons for K-12 Educators. We actually just finished this course because it was a facilitated online course that we offered for free for about seven weeks. We're going to offer it again in July. Um, and how you can sign up for that is to head on over to schoolofopen.org that offers courses on copyright, Creative Commons licensing, and related open matters. And schoolofopen.org has an announcements list that you can sign up for where we'll um, announce when we launch the next round of courses. But the Get Creative Commons Savvy Challenge and a lot of other courses are available for you to take at any time. And this is the uh, link in case um, you need it. But I think that's all. And I don't know if I should answer questions now or later, but um, thank you. I hope you learned something. Thanks. Thanks. So much, so much, Jane. Um, um, I think we're going to handle any questions, questions through, through chat. chat. And please do ask questions anytime you have them in the chat window. But I think we're going to go ahead and go on in the interest of time. And I'm going to turn it over um, to Verena to talk about the benefits, benefits of, OER of OER for K-12. Hi. It's Verena. And uh, if you can hear me, please say hi in the chat box so I know you can. Uh, I work um, <laughs> based out of Calgary, Alberta. Hello. And I, uh, this year I've worked on developing the Open Classroom with Alberta Distance Learning Center. So everything I've been doing uh, uses Creative Commons licensing and the goal was to try to create and use as many open educational resources as possible. Now the reason I even thought about this is because when I think of open educational resources, I think of the story, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie by Laura Numera. Has anyone ever heard of this kind of story or one of the versions of uh, If You Give a Mouse? No? Okay. Not really? Some? Yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're, yeah, common. So I took this from Wiki, uh, Wiki, um, Wikipedia. The book is known for its playful circular pattern. A boy gives a cookie to a mouse. The mouse asks for a glass of milk. He then requests a straw. It goes on and on and on and on. And we get more and more and more frustrated towards the end and exhausted. And we go in a giant circle when it's complete when he wants a cookie to go with it, which tells you that we just started right back at the beginning. That to me is what traditional resources kind of represent, this exhausting going on and on and on and on repetition and we end up at the beginning. And we end up at the very beginning and we haven't made it anywhere yet. So OER to me represents breaking the pattern. You can see in this picture if you look at regular content, there's some attempts at breaking patterns within um, K-12 
today, lots of examples, but open educational resources open the doors wide open and create new and inventive and engaging ways of thinking about content and learning in totally different ways. So really, instead, it's about discovering the open waters. And, and this is what we all see right now when we see the textbooks and the common digital content. But open educational resources really focus on the parts that are harder to get to. So I'm here to tell you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like they're looking at each other saying, no, nah, I don't think it will work. Let's do something different, something smarter, something cooler. That's what open educational resources are all about. The big thing is it saves time and it leaves more time to spend with your students. Specifically, this happens, and we'll learn a little bit more about it, because the content is created by the students and it's going to be different every time, so the teacher learns with the students. You can create and remix more meaningful content. Now I noticed I put two videos on the bottom here, and they're actually the wrong links. So I will show you, put in the original links, and I'll tell you why that's important so as soon as I put them in. And if you want, you can go off and uh, quickly check why I might have done that. The other day I found a post, a blog post, and it was about a kindergarten teacher who had created a wonderful opportunity for his class. And that's what these actual links are in the box right now. And he asked, um, the kids had created their own movie, and on this blog post he said to the world, we've created it, but can you remix it and make it different and, and create to it? And specifically, can you add audio? Because my kids weren't able to add audio. I think it is a wonderful representation <laughs> of how uh, you can think of open educational resources. He started something in his class with the basics and the foundations that he had and sent it out to the world. And you will see in the links two other teachers that created a blog post and remixed it and created a new and different version of the video that um, meets and exceeds any common core standards and expectations. And one of them was done by Chad Sansing, and, and his one in particular is pretty incredible because he integrated um, kindergarten language and, and words, and he was really careful with how he created it, and he integrated uh, common ideas from Star Wars. So that gives you an idea of creating and remixing more meaningful content. This picture, creating an open classroom, was a course that I created and worked with, and it was seven days of how to become a connected learner. The neat thing about this was I did it completely in the open, and I had feedback from around the world on how it was designed, how it worked, and I have to be totally honest, the world helped me create a better course because I did it in the open and asked them to help me in Remix. It is all uh, Creative Commons. We have to accept that we are not all good at everything, and you can remix, contribute, and add to something that has already been started. This will help to encourage authentic learning experiences and connections. So that we have to kind of force ourselves to move away from the static textbook, create the books that come to life, and you can see that these are, uh, I think they are iPads in there coming to life. And I just love this picture that I found on Flickr, but of course I have lost the attribution, which is bad, so I now need to find it. But it is a common co uh, Creative Commons license. The idea of monkey see and monkey do. When we see teachers and educators making an attempt to try to figure out how to connect with kids in authentic ways and learn together, you're going to create the sustainable learning environments for all. So these are the opportunities by utilizing digital resources, remix resources, uh, copying other people. <laughs> You're right, that Peggy. Thinking about things as it's not just you, it's a huge community out there. Um, you get to intergenerational and international learning. These are the kindergarten students from that blog post that we saw before, and this picture totally inspired me because even looking at the picture is an open educational resource because it teaches others what we could do and the idea that nothing is impossible. Look at this. They actually put the little label, computer running stop motion software. <laughs> 
This will lead to self-directed learning and connected learning, and this is a great, I don't have the link for this, but we do need to find a connected learning uh, website because it gives you all sorts of ideas on what we can do. So when we engage with the kids, it encourages them to think for themselves and, uh, and promotes what they're passionate about. It also, when we think about it, when we start learn using open educational resources, not only do we save time, we connect with kids, we build relationships, it helps to um, create personal learning environments. And it helps the students figure out what personal learning environments are. And if we look at the report, the Horizon report, that puts us ahead of the game. So this year it says that we're just kind of using mobile apps and t uh, tablet computing in one year or less. But we're ahead of the game if we're thinking about, well, games-based learning, but also personal learning environments. So the benefits of OER in K-12, breaking a pattern and change. It promotes sharing of resources. You discover new ideas and content. More time to spend on learning encourages authentic learning experiences. Learners are all all ages. There's no restriction. There's no K to 12 restriction anymore. We all learn together. You create sustainable learning environments for all that are self-directed and connected learning experiences. And it promotes the idea that we are ahead of the game and that we are innovators together. And I think that that is it for me. Now I'm getting confused because we're different colors on the slide. Thanks so much, Verena. So I feel like we should just pause for a moment and I'll take a breath. But I hope that now, um, after you've heard from Jane about sort of what open is and how the Creative Commons licenses work, and from Verena about why open um, has benefits for education and what some of those benefits are, I think the next question that often comes to mind is, where can you find all this OER stuff, and particularly where can you find the best OER, um, because there's a lot out there. And certainly you can do a Google search or go to the Creative Commons search tool, or there are lots of other repositories of OER. Um, but what I want to share right now is just some of the most specific best resources for K-12 that I've found. And this is by no means a comprehensive list, but I find that um, when I'm searching for OER, if I have something specifically I need, if I can go, if I have a familiarity with the sites and I can go to um, the one that's most likely to have it, I save myself a lot of search time. So one of the things that I've put together, and I'm going to put this link in the chat, this is um, a live binder that has what I think are some of the best OER for K-12. And if you're not familiar with LiveBinder, it's just a really quick way to put together a set of resources. And you can actually take my LiveBinder and save as a copy of it and adapt it for your own needs to share with people if you want. So you know, if you are specifically interested in math and science or you're interested in online courses but not textbooks, um, you can go in and modify that. And that content.k12opened.com um, will just redirect to that LiveBinder. And there are tabs for each curriculum area as well as um, different um, types of resources like textbooks, videos, um, online courses. And what I want to do now is just quickly highlight a few of what I think are some of the best resources out there. And all of these are in the live binder. And then they're also in that OER handout that I put in the file transfer link. But this is just kind of a short list. Um, one of my favorite sites for open license photos is Flickr. And I think I screenshotted this a week ago, and today I went in and Flickr's interface has changed, so it looks a little bit different. Um, but as of this morning, there were 261,244,466 open licensed photos on Flickr. And that is just an amazing number, and there are some really, really um, high quality um, photos in there. And particularly, I find for myself, a lot of times I'm looking to either give students building blocks of content 
or um, build my own thing. And rather than looking for a whole start to finish course, I'm, I'm often looking for these pieces. So Flickr is definitely a good place to look for that. And one thing that you just will um, want to know, in, in Flickr as well as in other tools, um, you can go in and do a search for just the open license materials. So in Flickr, if you go to the advanced search, there is a box that says only search for Creative Commons licensed content. And then there's a couple options below that. But if you turn that on, um, all your searches sort of within that session will come up with open license things. And a lot of other sites have that option as well. So on Google, um, it's under usage rights under the advanced options. And if you're, ha if you're working with students and having them put together presentations and they're using uh, Google image search, it's great to teach them how to go in and look for the things that are um, legally allowed to be shared and modified. Um, and then also YouTube has this option now. And this last window shows in YouTube where you can put the um, Creative Commons. And most sites now that have a search, especially for media, have an option. And it's usually in the advanced category where you can go check off and say, look for open licensed uh, materials. Um, in the area of. ELA and reading specifically, I love the site um, freereading.net. This is a comprehensive um, K-3 reading intervention program. It has just tons and tons of great resources. It has a whole selection of um, printable uh, early early reading stories that all um, correlate to a, to a research-based um, scope and sequence. And one of the things, just to talk about remixing, one of the things um, that we did with this site is we took, they have these really nice printable reading passages, and we took them and made them into things more interactive. So we made them into e-books that could be re read on the Kindle or um, other e-readers, and then we made some of them into voice threads so that students could hear the story being read or even record their own. And that's sort of the flexibility you have with OER that doesn't exist with um, traditionally copyrighted materials. And particularly as we're taking more and more things to a digital format, um, having that legal flexibility to do that is just a tremendous advantage. Um, this is a website um, that my group has put together and worked on, and it's an open dictionary for kids. And we've been working on this for several years. We have over 10,000 words to find now in kid-friendly language. And this project came about because in creating a lot of um, resources for students, ebooks, lesson plans, online courses, we found that we always wanted to include that vocabulary support, but there wasn't really um, a good dictionary that was open licensed and written in kid-friendly language. A lot of them, the, the definitions are harder than the word itself. So um, we've put together this open dictionary, and there's a piece called the Glossary Builder, where you can, and that's what's shown here, you can just go in and type in a comma-separated list of words, and it'll pop up a glossary. And then you can export that in HTML. You can export it as a Moodle glossary, a PowerPoint, or a bunch of other formats. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. That's sort of my my project that I am just deeply involved in and love. And we'd love to see more people there. Um, this is a great site. In math, a lot of people are familiar with Khan Academy videos. And the Khan Academy 2,000 plus videos are all open licensed. But this is a new site that's a little um, not quite as well known that has similar content, um, but it, just a different take on it. And it's Math is Power for You. And again, there are, um, I think, something like 2,600 um, videos and other resources on this site. And I would say the focus is more secondary, but there is some elementary as well. In the science area, um, FET out of the University of Colorado at Boulder has some fabulous um, math and science um, interactive simulations and really, really some good stuff and also available in many, many different languages. So definitely take a look at that. And they have really good um, support and a, a community of people around that as well. Um, and that's a group that um, we, on Peer-to-Peer -peer University School of Ed, we did an online course on that as well, just to sort of connect people around how you might use these resources. Um, probably the best known and the most comprehensive site for open textbooks is CK12 at ck12.org. Um, focus is on STEM, but they have other topics as well. And 
they're adding a lot of multimedia and other materials as well. And some, um, some states have adopted these textbooks to use as their sort of official um, adopted curriculum, but you can also use them as building blocks. So taking pieces of this, supplementing it with um, multimedia or your own resources, bring it into an online course format, or there are states who are using this in a print format and saving um, thousands and thousands of dollars. And Utah is a really good example of that. Um, Curriki is a website that is just a big, big collection of open resources, primarily developed by teachers, although some of them are developed by um, commercial groups, like this Algebra 1 course was developed by um, AT&T. And I find that Curriki is also a great place to share your own resources, and that's where I post a lot of resources that I want to share. So I posted earlier um, a lesson that I've used with students to explore copyright and open licensing for their own content, and that's posted on Curriki. So great place if you want to share your own resources, as well as tap into all the great things other people are doing. And then the last one I want to mention is I'm doing some really exciting work with um, P2PU around open professional learning. And the idea here is um, just a whole different model of professional development that is more um, participant driven and really inquiry based from what the teachers who are participating um, want to know. And I know some of you here have, have been a part of some of those courses. Um, I think it's a really exciting model and we're definitely always looking for um, new school partners and other people who want to take part in that. And it's all open licensed. So any school who wanted to tap into the courses that we've developed, and we have things on differentiating instruction, um, we have a project where students are writing grants, we have an online makerspace, just a whole big variety of things, you could take any of that content and reuse it um, any way you want. Just attribute the source, that's the one requirement. And lastly, um, I just want to close by talking about how you can open license and share your own work because everybody sharing more is what makes this whole thing really work. Um, at the very, very most basic way, if you just write on the front of your resources um, licensed under Creative Commons and the license you pick, that will tell people that it's okay to share it. Um, a little more advanced way is what Jane talked about, which is using the Creative Commons um, license chooser tool. And it just asks you a couple really easy questions like, do you care if people sell your stuff? And do you want to enforce sharing down the road? And then based on the answer for those, it'll supply you with the license, the little piece of artwork that says CC. And then it also gives you um, code that you can put into your website. And it's just like a little code snippet that you would put in the HTML window. And what that does is it, it supplies data so that the open search engines will find your stuff. So if somebody goes into Google and they look for um, a lesson plan on biomes and they check the box that say they want to find things that are, that are Creative Commons licensed, your stuff will come up because it has that metadata. Um, so that's, that's a little more advanced way. And then the last way is put, post your things on an OER site like Curriki um, because that's sort of an, a known place. And I find, especially with Curriki, um, a lot of, I have a lot of people share and, and write me about how they use my stuff and I've made a lot of connections. And to me, that's one of the really exciting things about this sort of sharing piece um, of this is just meeting a lot of new people and knowing that other people are using our materials and vice versa. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our final speaker, which is Jason Neifer. And he is going to talk about um, a case study um, with his Digital Academy actually using OER. Thanks, Karen. Um, hi, my name is Jason Neifer, and I'm the curriculum director of the Montana Digital Academy, which is a statewide virtual school in the lovely state of Montana. And um, I don't know how many of these slides are going to show up here, so we're going to play a little kind of slide roulette and see what happens. But a little bit about me to start off with. Um, I am a former classroom teacher. I spent 13 years in a variety of different classrooms, social studies, uh, speech debate, computer science, uh, journalism, everything from credit recovery to advanced placement classes. And I also have a lot of background 
in integrating technology in um, various modes of the K-12 classroom. I'm also a doctoral candidate at the University of Montana in Educational Technology. And the reason why I mention these things is because I do have quite a bit of experience working in a lot of different classroom contexts. And when I was hired as the curriculum director of MTBA in 2010, one of the things that I was charged with was trying to find ways to uh, empower my teachers to give them opportunities to utilize resources in a flexible manner that could be used in an online environment in a clever or useful way. So one of the things I want to talk about today is a little bit how my organization has uh, utilized open education resources as a critical part of our development process and a little bit about what we do to use these resources in context. So first, a little bit about my organization. Uh, MTDA is a statewide virtual school in the state of Montana. We are just three years old. Um, according to the Keeping Pace Report from the INACOL organization, which is one of the, the organizations that is an advocate for online learning in the United States, MTDA is the 12th largest statewide virtual school. And if you take us per capita, we are the sixth statewide virtual school in the United States, something we're very proud of because we've only uh, been in existence since 2010. We offer courses uh, in a variety of different contexts and in a variety of different formats, but our three primary uh, course delivery models are original credit courses, which are typical online courses taught in a cohort model for students to be uh, to, to take credit for the first time. We have a credit recovery program used mostly on um, a, a vendor-based solution to deliver flexible learning recovery or credit recovery courses. And then also a middle school world language program that's more or less a workshop model where students take seven week workshops to introduce themselves to a variety of world languages. Uh, we offer a wide variety of courses, everything from uh, personal finance to AP language to AP physics to Irish Gaelic language. Uh, we currently have over 120 course titles in different formats on our schedule and we do really serve a wide variety of learners. Um, my students are literally located uh, across the state of Montana. We are the fourth largest state by geography in the United States. And as you can see here, our students are literally all over the place uh, throughout Big Sky Country. Uh, the purple or grayish dots there are students. Our pink dots are the teachers that teach inside of my program. You can literally see that almost everywhere where there are human beings in Montana, there are students taking online courses with Montana Digital Academy. So one of the things I want to talk about is how we've utilized um, open education resources in order to develop or deliver curriculum to students in Montana. Basically, if you start a statewide virtual school, and this is not unlike a, a school in a face-to-face -face environment, there are basically four ways that you can get content um, in order to deliver uh, programs to students. And we call these the four Bs, barter, buy, build, and buddy. So you can barter and trade with others, you can buy from a large variety of vendors that are located um, in, in all corners of, of the educational markets. Uh, you can build a course yourself, or you can co-develop courses. And MTDA actually uses courses in all four of these formats. However, in our first year, we spent most of our time developing in the buy model because of our short time frame. We had just six months from the time our director was hired until we started delivering courses to students. Uh, we had relatively limited staff capacity. Almost all of my instructors were first-time online instructors in 2010. And because we had a limited number of available resources to support teachers in that process. However, MTDA has slowly but surely began evolving towards utilizing more open education resources because we have discovered it's a much better solution to provide tools for teachers to empower themselves to do a better job of teaching online. So over time, we've had several justifications for um, our decision-making process. First, obviously, as a state program, we do have limited funds. Um, I'm not a charter school. I do not get per-student funding from the state of Montana. We're given a single appropriation. And as our teachers have wanted to develop their own processes and their own curriculum objects for, for their students, we need to find objects that were you know, more reasonably cost, that didn't uh, you know, cost more than our instructional services to provide curriculum. 
Second, philosophically, we believe in open education. We are very strongly uh, uh, fans of the components of, of developing resources and offering them to others because education is all of our goal broadly for students and not just in one state or one nation or one classroom or in one district. Um, the quality of open education resources has dramatically increased over the last decade. And most importantly, is the notion of flexibility. One of the biggest problems we've run into by using commercial resources is that when my teachers start to get the capacity internally to ultimately um, uh, start creating their own lessons or want to modify the curriculum in order to make it better fit their students' needs, many traditionally licensed resources don't offer the flexibility that my teachers require in order to modify those assets to better deliver the curriculum to students. And so for all these reasons, we've slowly started moving towards um, the open education resource model. Now we have a wide variety of libraries that we use, and that's where this slide here would be useful, but um, Karen talked about some of the same resources that we use, but basically we see this in terms of providing links to our teachers who then use that as part of their curriculum library. In the same way that a face-to-face -face classroom teacher might have a textbook or some supplemental series, up there's a slide there, um, in order to deliver various pieces of a classroom puzzle, we provide our teachers the NROC solutions, the open courseware uh, from the Open High School of Utah, the open course library from the state of Washington, connections out of Texas, the CK-12 nonprofit, which publishes wonderful virtual textbooks, and the Georgia Virtual Learning Academy, which is not only a partner of ours in co-development, but a producer of open education resources. And we've been very impressed with the flexibility and quality of these various resources. Results of this process have been pretty stellar. Uh, we have started moving away from commercial resources, and a majority of our new courses utilize either open education resources completely or OER used in conjunction with a content area expert or classroom teacher to develop those resources in a meaningful way. Over time, it decreases our per student cost because the core cost of curriculum no longer exists. It introduces significant flexibility to our instructors, so they're able to better modify their lessons internally to deliver the best possible instruction to students. And most importantly, it gives us the ability to partner with other statewide virtual schools. MTDA is part of a statewide virtual school leadership alliance, which is nine statewide virtual schools. And one of the things we do together is redevelop content. So oftentimes we will take a course like high school earth science or seventh grade mathematics and between the various statewide virtual schools redevelop open education resources inside of our models for the purpose of developing courses from scratch. It gives us all the flexibility I talked about before plus empowers our teachers to give them resources they know they can adjust as much as they want to. So I think we've jumped to the end there so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, I'm happy to take any questions about our particular programs, um, uh, open educational resource uh, use, and if not, I think, oh, there's that slide. Uh, one of the things I, I do want to mention is that here's what we plan on doing next for um, uh, open education resources. First, we think that at least inside of our program, using OER in our regular development cycle is a key piece of this, and we started that process. But most importantly, we really want to encourage our teachers to start adapting, modifying, using, and then ultimately building their own open education resources. This is something that not a lot of statewide virtual schools or even individual teachers have done much of yet, but I think this is an important part of the advocacy. It's not only using what's out there, but ultimately empowering yourself and your instructors to release materials in that model. Um, obviously, we really want to work with face-to-face -face schools in Montana to also adopt OER, and then again, eventually develop and release our own OER. I think it's a slow evolution. Um, if you're new to open education resources, I think a key piece of this process is starting um, small by using the resources, but if you end up getting teachers that feel, as my teachers do, they're empowered by this licensing model and encourage them to develop their own resources and release it to the community. One of the things that I think is really interesting about open education resources is that a lot of teachers vastly underestimate what their resources could do for others. Even thoughts that are incomplete or not uh, complete ideas or not even complete lessons 
releasing those types of resources in one of the many repositories, like Curriki, for example, can be a spark for someone to take that idea and turn it into something even better. So if you build sharing and developing into your local school model, whether you're a virtual school, a face-to-face -face school, or a blend of both, that can ultimately increase the massive library that has been growing in order to provide resources and opportunities for both teachers and students alike. So I think that concludes my part of the presentation. And I think we could probably skip uh, to, well, and that's my contact information if you're interested. I'm all about self-promotion. So I think it's question and comment time um, if you have any of those now. Thank you, Jason. Um, we do have just a couple minutes for um, questions and answers or comments. If people have their own open resources that we haven't covered that you'd like to share, this would be a great time to do that. And I do have a final slide with our contact information, uh, including our Twitter handles. I know all of us are active on Twitter and talk a lot about OER. Um, on Twitter. So if you're looking for just to be able to connect with people around this. And if you have any questions about how OER might be useful for you or if you're looking for specific resources um, and not sure where to look, definitely um, send us emails and I know I would be happy to, um, to bounce ideas around. That's a good question, Peggy. Is there a regular Twitter chat for OER? Um, there is not that I'm aware of, but the hashtag is OER for for OER specifically, and then um, also open, just for a broader discussion of open learning. And I know um, the idea of open learning is something that Verena and I have been sort of exploring beyond just open open licensed resources. Um, what does open learning mean, and sort of what does it look like, and how does it affect learning? Which is really really interesting to me because I think um, OER and specific resources is a big piece of it, but when we open up the whole learning process, that gets even more interesting. So um, I'm scanning for questions. If anybody has any, um, let us know. And otherwise, um, make sure to do the evaluation of the session, which Kristen put up a link for. And I just want to thank, again, um, Liz and Kristen and the whole team and the university and all the sponsors. I think um, this 4T conference is just a really great thing and certainly a great example of, of open learning. So thank you all for being here today. And we'll hang around for a couple minutes if there are questions or get in touch with us on email or Twitter. And thanks, everybody.